Today we're going to be taking a look inside the Volkswagen Audi 1.8 liter turbo engine to see what's inside and how it works. Now we don't have to look too far as to why this engine is here. You can see it's a very common problem with these is that the timing belt fails and that's going to cause a lot of destruction inside. We're going to be fully tearing down this engine to see just what happens when you don't do preventative maintenance to change your timing belt. Now this is an EA113 engine. It's a 1.8 liter four cylinder engine that has a turbocharger that's mounted over here on the exhaust side. Now what's interesting about this engine, it's out of a 2002-ish Volkswagen Passat, is that it's situated longitudinally just like a rear wheel drive car would, except that this is actually a front wheel drive car. Now this longitudinal platform and engine is shared with the Audi A4, which they do offer in all wheel drive. Taking a quick look around this engine here, you can see it is driven off of a timing belt and we've got all the accessories up at the front here. The AC compressor would sit over on this side, here we've got the alternator alternator here we've got the water pump that's behind this mechanical fan and then the power steering pump at the bottom here now the driver's side here we've got a metal intake plenum there's a fuel rail along the top here because this is port injected only and then we've got our coil packs on the top here for the four spark plug out of the back here underneath the intake on the driver's side is where the oil filter is located and it's underneath a oil cooler you've also got oil lines that are going to tee off of it and go to the other side for the turbo charger as well as a bunch of these vacuum lines and coolant lines that run around here here you can see the engine mount that we mounted on the left side passenger frame rail finally over on the back side here we've got a heat shield because that exhaust and turbocharger assembly is going to get pretty hot sitting back here we do have our oil return and our oil feed lines for the turbocharger. This does use an iron block with an aluminum head. Now I'm going to begin tearing down this engine by removing all these accessories from the front half of the engine here. Here you can see the serpentine setup. We've got this giant belt tensioner over here, crank pulley, power steering, water pump, and then the alternator. And I can remove that tensioner, peel off this belt here, power steering pump, water pump pulley. Mm, I need a strong... Uh, Okay. The alternator needs two bolts, the power steering pump needs four. I remove the accessory bracket from the driver's side. So it appears this is not the actual water pump, this is just a fan drive pulley. Alright, next up at the bottom here. Now with that stuff out of the way, we can take a look at the cooling system. So the actual water pump is inside of this assembly over here, driven off of the timing belt, which means that when you do a timing belt, it's recommended to replace the water pump. Now just behind that, we have the thermostat housing. It is actually made of plastic and it's bolted directly to the steel block. And we've got this line that comes down here with a coolant temperature sensor and heads off to the rest of the cooling system. I'm going to go ahead and remove the thermostat housing and I'll pop off the thermostat. So next we're going to work on this intake. You can see at the bottom here we have a drive-by wire throttle body which is going to come from your charge pipe coming from your intercooler and bring air into the engine. Now this engine has just port fuel injection so this here is a fuel rail. You have a fuel pressure regulator over here and you've got a coolant tube that runs across the intake down to the back of the engine here. Now I noticed something with these older Volkswagens is they tend to use more hex bolts than triple squares or torques. Pop off the fuel rail. Now it looks like this is a return system because you have the input port and the exit port here. And I'll just pop this hose off here. Next I'm removing the air intake and one thing I don't like about Volkswagen you can see this is a 10 millimeter bolt and the rest of them are all small hexes. I don't like hexes because they can strip out and I don't like the fact that you have to use two different tools to remove the same part. Now I'll just pop this off here. Now unlike modern vehicles this doesn't have any flaps inside of here that adjust the airflow length. There's a really long slender intake runner. And with the intake out of the way, we have a closer look at the oil filter and cooler assembly. Now additionally, you can see the crankcase ventilation. It's going to come up off of this block over here and be sent up towards the valve cover. I'm going to remove some of these hoses that go over to the valve cover so we can get to the head. So yeah, while well, I accidentally broke this hose, I found that there's still a lot of carbon and stuff built up inside of this hose. It means that the oil separator is not doing its job and allowing carbon to go back into the head. How many hoses when you have this air injection system on this side of the way. This is your oil line feed for your turbocharger. Comes off of the oil filter. This coolant temperature sensor and inlet. Next I'm going to remove the valve cover. I also have to remove these ignition coils. These don't even have a bolt holding them down like normal cars. Underneath the valve cover looks a little crusty, but this here is the baffling for the PCV system. Now looking under the valve cover, you can see we have a double overhead cam design with the exhaust on this side and the intake over on this side, which has these useless plastic baffles. Now what's interesting is the cam to crank is actually powered by a timing belt, 
whereas the cam to cam is powered by a timing chain. Now the valve cover gasket and even the spark plug tube seals feel more like a head gasket because they're very thick and they're reinforced with a polymer and it appears that we might have a hydraulic chain tensioner for the cam to cam chain. Now up here at the front of the engine we have our camshaft position sensor. Now the design of the camshafts themselves are a little bit interesting. This is a five valve per cylinder which means that you have one, two, three valves for the intake and that's held on with a shared bearing cap for two bearing surfaces. Whereas over here on the exhaust side, you just have two valves. So in total you have three plus two five valves with just a single bearing cap over on this side. Alright, so in order to properly get the head bolts out, I gotta remove these camshafts. So we're gonna go ahead and remove the cam bearings, the RT30. I'm gonna remove these cam caps here, get these camshafts off here. Now the head bolts on this thing are a very interesting six point spline. It's not exactly a Torx. I was able to get this one bolt off the exhaust side using a regular T50 Torx. As you can see it's a bit loose, but this socket is actually too shallow to go into the other head bolt holes. So I'm gonna have to order another tool in order to get this out. All right, so while we wait for that socket, we're gonna go ahead and work on the bottom end. So here we are at the bottom of the engine. We've got an aluminum oil pan. And you can see this area here with the three bolts is where an oil level sensor would be, probably on the more luxurious Audi models. And then this would be your oil return from the turbocharger. This engine does sit slightly slanted, that's why the oil pan is slanted, so it's flat when it's underneath the vehicle. Over here on the timing side, I can't take out the crankshaft bolt in order to access the timing components. So we're going to first try to pull the pan. Now for those of you who have a Passat and you know what this does, let me know in the comments section below, because it looks a little weird. At least the oil pan bolts are a 10 millimeter. Yeah, remove the oil pan. Inside the oil pan is pretty nasty and it does look a little bit sludgy so I wonder if some water got into this engine. And indeed there is sludge in this engine. You could see that this oil pickup tube has a bit of it inside of here and it's actually kind of blocked up in there. Now taking a look underneath this engine here you can see we've got the crankshaft, it's got its reluctor wheel here. We have a plastic baffle. That's to capture all the oil and bring it near the oil pickup tube over here which is then going to send oil into this oil pump which is chain driven, which is interesting because this engine has a remix of chains and belts. This baffle is just floating in there. It's held on by one bolt. I'll just remove that. Yeah, this engine is pretty sludged up. Everything here is pretty sticky instead of oily. I'm gonna remove the 10 millimeter bolts that hold the oil pump. I'm gonna knock this oil pump fully loose. And then I can pop off this oil pump. Now taking a look inside of this engine, you can see that it's pretty strongly built. You do have only two bolts though per main cap. There's no extra bracing across here. But then again, it is an iron block, so it doesn't need extra bolts holding it in. The way an aluminum block would. I don't feel any loose connecting rods or anything obviously damaged down at the bottom here. Anyway, at the back here, I forgot to loosen off these 10 millimeter bolts that hold the rear main seal on before I put the engine stand on. Should have done that before I mounted it. So now I gotta do it the old school way with a wrench. All right, so I've got a bar jammed into here. I'm gonna go ahead and see if I can break this crank bolt loose. Yes, that's pretty tight for a German engine. Here's the crank bolt and here's the harmonic balancer. All right, I'm gonna take off these 10 millimeter bolts that hold this timing cover on. Now surprisingly, the timing cover is actually made of steel and not plastic. Now here we can see the timing components. We've got the crankshaft over here, the water pump, and this is the tensioner over here along with a very small idler pulley and this is the remnants of what's left of that timing belt. So while I'm still working to get this crankshaft out, I'm going to remove these e-torx bolts that hold the connecting rod caps on. And I can take these out. And these bearings look fine. They don't look really worn out or anything. So I don't think there's anything wrong with the bottom end of this engine. And these bearings look good too on the outside. Now this engine has five main bearings. These are all 17 millimeter bolts. So I'm going to go ahead and break them free. Now we'll just run these off. All five of these main bearings look perfect, as well as the crankshaft. Now the last thing holding the crankshaft in is this front seal here, and it's all held in by 10 millimeter bolts. And there's that front oil seal. And further down here we have our timing belt tensioner. It's actually part of the cover here that bolts to the block. And it's just a simple spring-loaded unit. There is no hydraulics inside of here. And then here we have the actual tensioner mechanism. All it is is just an eccentrically mounted pulley that's going to be pushing up against the timing belt to take up any slack. And then I can remove that. All right, then inside of here, inside of here we have the water pump. Now, as you can see, Volkswagen is using a metal impeller before they switched to plastic. The plastic ones were pretty troublesome. Now here's the chain drive for the oil pump, and the tensioner is just spring-loaded. So now I'm going to see if we can pull up this crankshaft here. Here we are. You ever wonder what happens if you use an impact on a oil filter? Let's find out. Oh, it went flying. 
Now here we can see the oil cooler a little bit more clearly. Coolant in, coolant out. And then if I remove this nut here, I can remove the oil cooler. That's basically just a heat exchanger. And then with that cooler out of the way, I can remove this last bolt here. And then I can remove this oil cooler and filter housing assembly from the block. Now once I remove this gasket here, you can clearly see that we've got two passages that go to the oil filter, then the other two passages that go from the cooling jacket to cool off the oil filter, and then this area here extends into the crankcase where your PCV system is going to work on. So that's as far as I can tear this down today. i got to go order that head bolt tool. So it's been a couple of days and a snowstorm later, and I was finally able to get my head bolt tool shipped in here. You can see with this head bolt tool that it's not really a Torx, it's just a six-pline drive. And what I like is that it's nice and long so it can sit down in these long cavities over here and grab onto the head bolt. Alright, so we're going to go ahead and untorque these head bolts here. It's a lot easier when you have the correct tool for the job. Now we're going to zip out these head bolts. Alright, now I'm going to go ahead and lift off the head. Now take a look inside of this engine. You can see the tops of the pistons are absolutely coated in this carbon buildup. This engine was not taken care of and it was definitely burning oil or even had a bad PCV system. So here we've got the main components of the engine laid out here. We're gonna take a closer look at the condition of this engine. So if you remember this engine had a broken timing belt that most likely broke while the vehicle was in operation. So if we take a look at the head here where most of the damage can be seen, if you remember the pistons are gonna be moving up and down and what the timing belt does is it keeps the correlation between the pistons movement up and down on the crankshaft to the camshaft is what drives these valves. Now this engine's got three intake valves and two exhaust valves for really good airflow. Unfortunately though, if the pistons is coming up at the same time a valve is pushing down well you're going to have piston to valve contact and that's what's going to cause you to bend the valves. So in this case here there's no camshafts inside so there's no pressure on the valves. You can see the exhaust valves are nice and sealed and the intake valves are also nice and sealed. But if we move over here to cylinder number one you can see that there is a gap here and that means that this valve and also this valve over here is bent. Now I also noticed a ton of carbon buildup, especially on cylinder number 3 here, which means that either the PCV system was dumping a lot of oil into this cylinder, or this engine was burning a ton of oil. If you want to examine the condition of these valves, you just take a hammer with a socket and hit it really, really hard, and then that'll free the valves. And if you turn the head over, you can pull out these valves, and here you can see how the valves are all bent up. There should be a straight piece that goes to here so it can perform a proper seal, but now because they're all bent, they cannot sit flush on this face over here and therefore can't seal properly. Now unfortunately fixing this is not just as easy as replacing the valves themselves because if the valve or the piston collided really fast, it could also cause damage to the head. Now also when you bend valves, it could also damage things like your valve stem seals down inside of there. So you'd have to take this thing to a machine shop to get fully remachined or you might just have to get a used head. Putting a used head on this thing is going to be very labor intensive. It might even total the engine or the car itself. However, if the valve to piston collision has caused so much damage as to damage the pistons themselves, which in this case I don't see too much damage, then you'd still have to replace the piston heads in order to have a proper engine. And of course, removing the piston heads entails that you have to disassemble most of the engine components and basically rebuild it. Now taking a look at these pistons here, you can see that they're absolutely gooed up with carbon. This engine was not healthy at all. And you can even see the oil control rings here are all gummed up. So either this engine skipped a lot of oil changes and it's been burning a lot of oil and that's what's causing this carbon buildup. This engine was really not taken care of. Especially given that they drove it until the timing belt broke. Nevertheless, in terms of the engine itself, I do have to admit, for a little 1.8 liter 4 cylinder engine, these are really beefy and heavy pistons. And because it's turbocharged, it definitely has to be because it's got to take more power than the engine size dictates. Now moving over here to the engine block, Volkswagen I think also did a good job here because they made it out of iron. Not very good for lightweight or economy, but it's definitely something that can take a lot of boost, especially when they put those turbochargers on here to put a lot of power through a small engine like this. Now generally speaking, when a timing belt blows it won't really take the block with it unless there's severe damage in the engine and you should be able to save this block. So taking a look at the block itself you can see this here is where the oil pickup tube is going to start from the oil pan and draw in fresh oil down inside of here it's then going to get filtered out and cooled off as we saw the oil filter and its cooling circuit and then sent back through the main oil galley you can see the outline of its casting down over here throughout the middle of the engine and that oil galley that runs down the middle here has these little holes that are going to tap down into it to feed oil to the crank shaft as well as the pistons to lubricate. Additional oil is going to tap off of that main oil galley and be sent out to the head over here. Now that oil flow is anybody sent up through the head through these holes over here to lubricate all of the components inside of the system over here. Now that oil is not only going to lubricate these camshafts but it's also got to feed the chain tensioner that goes between the chain of the camshaft and the crankshaft 
which is this guy over here. Now this is a very interesting chain tensioner. You can see it's got slides on the bottom as well as on the top over here. And it's going to take the oil from this section over here. There's a small screen inside of here and that's what's going to push on this piston over here to put some tension on that chain. Now just like the timing belt, if this chain tensioner fails, like newer Volkswagens, then you can also have a timing chain related issue where you skip timing and also bend valves. Now since this is an older engine design, Volkswagen did not think to put variable valve timing on this and that's why you just have a very simple timing gear where the cam and crankshaft are directly related to each other with no cam phasing. And there you have it, this is what happens when you don't maintain your engine, you don't change its oil, it becomes all sludged up like this. And more importantly, you don't change your timing belt, it snaps, leaves you on the side of the road, bends the valves and also takes out the head. So you really want to make sure that you keep up with your oil changes and the timing belt changes. Even though these timing belt changes could be costly, it's definitely a lot cheaper than replacing the head plus a tow truck on the side of the road. Oh yeah, and while you're in there, make sure you change the water pump. It is driven off of the timing belt and it's probably only a couple extra bucks to change it out because when it does leak, you pretty much have to do the job all over again. So if you don't want bad things to happen, make sure you invest in that timing belt change and basic maintenance on your vehicle and subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one.